Tonight we resume our George P. Schultz lecture series, and our speaker is Admiral Stavridis, the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And he was formerly the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. This event is sponsored by the Marines Memorial Association and the World Affairs Council. The Marines Memorial Association is a nonprofit veterans organization chartered to honor the legacy of military service. We provide a living memorial in this Marines Memorial Club with the facilities for forums and meetings such as this evening. You can learn more about our association and our over 240 reciprocal clubs if you go to our website, www.marineclub.com. The World Affairs Council of Northern California offers a forum with diverse audiences engaged in dialogue that can inform their actions. The mission of World Affairs Council is to explore issues and opportunities that transcend borders. And you can learn more about the World Affairs Council by going to their website, worldaffairs.org. Jane Wales is the president. She's the moderator for the program, and she's the president of World Affairs Council and the host of the nationally syndicated weekly national public radio show, World Affairs. She's vice president of the Aspen Institute and CEO of the Global Philanthropy Forum. Jane held a senior position in the Clinton and the Carter administrations, serving as special assistant to the president and senior director of the National Security Council. She was the associate director of the White House Office of Science and Technology and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. I mention this because the World Affairs Council is such an important part in this partnership with the Marines Memorial, and we are so grateful to the World Affairs Council. It's my job to introduce George P. Schultz, and then he will introduce our speaker. Before I introduce him, I want to thank him publicly for lending his name to this lecture series. To have such a distinguished public servant as George P. Schultz, this lecture series is it's a real honor for the Marines Memorial. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the bio of the former Secretary of State George P. Schultz, I refer you to the program where we attempt to condense his spectacular career into a few sentences. I would like to point out he's held four different cabinet posts in our government, one of only two Americans who have that distinction and he really needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a distinguished American, George P. Schultz. We have a real treat in store for us this evening. I remember when Mike came and proposed to have this George P. Schultz lecture, and we talked about it a little while, and we said, you know, we'll do something distinctive in San Francisco. Our lecture will always be a high-ranking military officer. Nobody else does that. For a while, it was hard to get anybody to come because they figured, I come to San Francisco, my God, I got killed. <clears throat> but then when Jim Jones was commandant, he came and it worked out well, and so we've had a parade. And this evening we have a really outstanding Admiral, Admiral James, Jim Stravetis, to talk to us. He is a genuine warrior scholar, maybe the most outstanding we've ever known. Served in the Navy for 30 years, he was NATO commander for, I think, five or six years. Then he was Southern Command and had them together, and that's the most years as a commandant, command, commander of armed forces in our nation's recent history. So as a warrior, he was right up at the top. Then as a scholar, 
He's the dean now of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. That's one of the outstanding uh, diplomatic places in the world in its research and its teaching. He has a PhD from there, and um, I have to get a piece of paper here to remind myself because it's really unbelievable. He has had, he's produced 22 articles, 11 books, I think it must be more than that because the one advertised up there I'm reading right now and it wasn't on the list I had, <laughs> and 70 op-eds. So he's really a scholar warrior. Jim Stravitas. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much, sir. It's uh, my honor to be here. General Myatt, thank you, and a very good evening to everybody. Normally, when people hear that um, introduction, that, that uh, bio, they actually see me in person. They have one overriding reaction, which is, I thought you'd be taller than you appear to be. <laughs> Well, what I thought we would do tonight, um, because we have so many wonderful Marines and sailors and Coast Guardsmen here in the audience, is talk a little about the world's oceans and use that as a framework for a broader geopolitical discussion that we'll undertake when Jane joins me and we have a conversation. But the format I'd like to use is to kind of sail with you around the world's oceans. And I, I start with simply a picture of the sea. And most of you probably know this, but 70% of the world's surface is water, 70%. Coincidentally, 70% of your body is water. And thirdly, 70% of the oxygen you breathe comes from the oceans, from photosynthesis in the oceans. The British Navy had a saying that I think is appropriate as you look at that map, the sea is one. In other words, it connects everywhere around the world. And it's also worth remembering and put something in context for you. Think about the Pacific Ocean. You could take all the land in the world and it would fit inside the Pacific Ocean alone. So these seas are vast, they're fundamental to us, and of course, it's also the economic aspect of the oceans that is crucial. 90% of all internationally traded goods move on these oceans through these choke points. And as a result of that, we are dependent on these seas environmentally, militarily, politically, and above all, economically. So let's get underway. We'll start with the Pacific. This is a 1589 chart of the Pacific by a, a Dutchman named Ortelis. But bottom right, you see the first sailors on the Pacific. You know, we tend to think of the European explorations. These Polynesians sailed these waters in voyages that were as far as 5,000 miles. 4,000 years ago, long before Greece, ancient Greece, was established. The Pacific is vast. It's been navigated not for centuries, but for millennia. And as you look at it in the U.S. perspective, and Secretary Schultz and I were speaking before dinner about World War II, in which he fought as an infantry officer in the U.S. Marine Corps, this is kind of the mental map of the United States about the Pacific. It's this World War II epic story, ends in Tokyo Bay when we have more aircraft carriers than we have ships today in the US Navy. And this is kind of our theory of the Pacific. But we ought to spend a little more time understanding how the Chinese think about the Pacific because we are, we are kind of on a little bit of a collision course with China. I don't think we'll end up going to war with China. We can avoid what some have called the Thucydides trap, but we ought to understand we did not get here first in the Pacific. So here's a tale of two ships for you. The bottom ship here, that's the Santa Maria, as in the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. 
That's to give you a sense of scale of the ship that Christopher Columbus sailed in when he discovered America. At the same time, everyone knows 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? 1492, you see that massive aircraft carrier behind it? That's a Chinese flagship of Admiral Zheng He, a contemporary of Christopher Columbus. That ship is 500 feet long, six decks, and had a crew of 450. The Chinese have sailed these waters for a long time, and we need to understand their position and how they think about it, as well as our own. So let's look a little more closely at China. China is a rising naval power. They have roughly the same number of ships, maybe a few more than the US Navy. They don't have the carriers, but they are pushing out. They are showing their flag. This is a Chinese ship arriving in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. We also see a growing naval confluence between the Chinese Navy, the People's Liberation Army's Navy is the formal name for their Navy. It's an odd name, People's Liberation Army's Navy. But they operate more and more with the Russian Navy. This is a Chinese frigate operating with a Russian destroyer in the South China Sea. They are operating today off the coast of Korea. They are operating together today in the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. So we see China moving and expanding and building aircraft carriers as well. So this backdrop of China in the Pacific is part of the geopolitics that we'll have to deal with. Fortunately, we have allies. We have strong allies, like Japan. This is Shinzo Abe, the prime minister of Japan, who is taking a uh, more forward-leaning stance in terms of the geopolitics of the region and aligning Japan more closely with us. And another significant ally for us, of course, is South Korea. We have others, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand, the Philippines. We have some <laughs> differences with the current president of the Philippines, but they are a treaty ally of the United States. So the United States is blessed in the Pacific with this network of allies, partners, and friends. And that's good because we have a problem in the Pacific. And the problem is North Korea. This is Kim Jong-un. You hear a lot about him these days. Uh, he's well-named, Kim Jong-un. He's unpredictable. He's untested. He's untried. He's unstable. He's not crazy. He has his own worldview, and it is a strategically sensible view when you look at his background, his life, and how he looks out from the Korean Peninsula. But I will tell you, there's the danger. You should think of it as kind of two streams that are coming together. One stream is nuclear weapons that can be hardened and miniaturized, and the other stream are ballistic missiles, intercontinental increasingly. When those two streams cross, and they are quite close to crossing, we will have a very fundamental decision to make, and that's why we spend a fair amount of time at the United Nations over the past few days talking about North Korea. So North Korea is a significant challenge in the region, and it's not the only challenge. Upper left, North Korea. Upper right, Chinese ballistic missile submarines, this rising Chinese Navy. Bottom left, artificial islands being built in the South China Sea an attempt by China to claim sovereignty over that vast sea space. And through that South China Sea moves 80% of the economy of Asia. So we have geopolitical challenges. We do have allies. I would predict that this theater, this ocean, this Pacific Ocean, will be the scene of a great deal of geopolitical activity and challenging in this century. So let's continue our voyage. Let's go to the Atlantic. I'm showing you here, of course, the North Atlantic. And what's the American map, mental map here? It tends to be this. Convoy operations, World War I, World War II, 
the Navy moving logistics and supplies, that Atlantic, the North Atlantic, is a transit zone, but more properly a bridge, a transatlantic bridge between the United States and Canada and our European allies upon which rests the NATO alliance. But again, there is history here. These are the great explorers of the Atlantic, many of whom, almost all of these, sailed from the Iberian Peninsula. Bottom right, most of you will recognize Christopher Columbus. Upper right is Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, who built a court of explorers. Top left is Magellan, who led the expedition that first circumnavigated the world, a Portuguese sailor. And bottom left, you won't recognize, but that's Bartolomeu Diaz, the first sailor of European background to sail into the Indian Ocean. So this North Atlantic has been a zone of transit, a transatlantic bridge. Today, it is being challenged again by Russia. I'm a Cold War sailor. I spent a great deal of my 37 years in the Navy playing the hunt for Red October in the North Atlantic and under the ice. And today, we see the Russian Federation returning, leaning back into that battle space. And we can remember this, the GI-UK gap, Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom. We're seeing the Russian Navy increasingly operating in this zone. So just as we see great power competition in the Pacific from China, we see great power competition in the Atlantic from a resurgent Russia. And we ought to remember there's more to the Atlantic than the North Atlantic. On the South Atlantic, incredibly important sea lanes of communication, an emerging, over time, superpower in Brazil, 220 million people, and on the African side, both South Africa and Nigeria, those three economies alone drive a significant level of trade. So not only do we have a North Atlantic, but in the South, we have a different set of actors with whom we have generally positive relations but the point is the Atlantic, the second largest of the world's oceans after the Pacific, will continue to be of great importance to the United States. Let's continue our voyage. Let's go to the Indian Ocean, the third largest of the world's great oceans. It began, bottom left, as a search for spices. Today it's increasingly hydrocarbons. It's challenged by piracy, but it is the home to one of the rising great powers of the 21st century, India. That's the Indian flag alongside the Pakistani flag. The Indian Ocean is part of the geopolitical competition between India and Pakistan, two nuclear armed powers. And we ought to recall that offshoots of the Indian Ocean are the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, the Red Sea, and the Arabian Sea, where we see today Iranian influence in this region that pushes in a maritime dimension, even as Iran pushes ashore across much of the near Middle East. And of course, this geopolitical competition has a religious underlie as well. Upper right, the flag of Iran, leader of the Shia world in the Muslim faith, Bottom left, the flag of Saudi Arabia, leader in the Sunni world, and of course in the middle of it, our strongest ally in the region. All of this will have a significant maritime component, particularly in the Arabian Persian Gulf. You can think of that as the Sunni Shia Gulf, as those two competing powers come together. And we ought to remember how Iran sees itself. The Iranians view themselves as an imperial power. This is the Iranian Persian Empire at its greatest expanse, about 2,400 years ago. Upper left are the battle flags of Cyrus the Magnificent and Darius the Great next to the Iranian flag. And look at all the water space around this. So the Indian Ocean, I think, will continue to be a zone of real challenge. Let's continue our voyage. 
Let's go to the Mediterranean. Many of you will have gone on a wonderful summer cruise on a great cruise liner to the Mediterranean, I'm sure. It's largely a peaceful body of water. Yet the Mediterranean Sea is where war at sea began. If I could just snap my fingers and bring back to life all of the mariners that have died in war at sea in the Mediterranean, all of the galleons that have been sunk, all of the triremes that went to the bottom and bring them all back, you could walk across the Mediterranean, across those ships. This is the Battle of Lepanto, one of the great hinges in history where the Ottoman Empire was stopped by the Holy Roman Empire, just as in our mental map, the Ottomans were stopped at the gates of Vienna. They were also stopped at the Battle of Lepanto. So where's the challenge today in the Med? It's in the east. It's the eastern Mediterranean, where we have a terrible civil war in Syria, 600,000 dead, 14 million displaced, many of them moving at sea. And of course, it becomes a great power competition between the United States backing one side and Russia backing the other. I'm always a little suspicious of historical analogies. They're, they're often overused. But if you look back 100 years ago at the origins of World War I and you look at the Balkans, a small area where great power politics collided, you have to worry about the Eastern Med. And of course, all of that challenge leads to this waves of refugees. Now, most of them have been stopped over the last 12 months because of a deal between the European Union and Turkey, largely. But this will resume. And so the Mediterranean, especially the Eastern Mediterranean, will have these kind of challenges. Well, let's come a little closer to home. Let's go to the Caribbean and see what our challenges are there. Bottom right, we tend to think of the Caribbean as the Spanish Empire, the galleons, the flow of gold and silver back from the Americas in the 16th, 17th centuries. Today, the gold, if you will, is the flow of goods, notably through the Panama Canal, which has just been improved and widened by the Panamanians. What are the challenges? These. Upper left, narcotics, that's our magnificent Coast Guard conducting a drug bust, upper right, gangs and gang violence. The most dangerous and violent countries in the world are not Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. They are Central America because of these, the Maras, the gangs. We all here in the United States have been watching closely and, and feeling with heavy hearts the damage to my home state, Florida, over the last 24 hours, terrible blows in Puerto Rico. Um, the Caribbean islands almost destroyed, natural disasters, again, leading to waves of refugees. So the Caribbean, while not a zone of great power competition, has its own set of challenges. Fortunately, we have interagency cooperation, including, as I mentioned, the Coast Guard. Look at that bottom right. That's actually a very hopeful picture. That's a high-tech Coast Guard vessel that's capturing a drug runner. The bad news is that the high-tech Coast Guard vessel is the one on the bottom in the photograph. The thing on the top that looks like Batman submarine, that was built in the jungle of Columbia. And when we caught this thing, when I was Southern Command, and truth in advertising, there's a Navy destroyer just outside the picture. <laughs> when we caught that thing, it had 10 tons of cocaine in it. Street value, $150 million right out there in San Francisco. So these are the challenges here in this region. And again, significant part of them happen at sea. Well, let's go to the top of the world. Let's go to the Arctic. This is the USS Jeannette, uh, a doomed Arctic exploration put on by the US Navy in the middle part of the 19th century. This is only 150 years ago, and yet many geographers felt and believed there was a temperate zone at the top of the earth. I mean, we knew nothing about this part of the world. 
The Jeanette was locked in the ice, crushed and sank. Most of its crew was killed. And here's a news flash. There is no temperate zone at the top of the world. But there might be in time because the ice is melting. Now, we could have a debate, I guess, about global warming and what causes it and how fast it's moving. But I'll tell you something as a simple mariner. The ice is melting. By the middle of this century, year round, we'll be able to sail across the top of the world. And that has significant implications for geopolitics, and it has significant implications for hydrocarbons and the recovery of hydrocarbons. Because at the top of the world, on one side is the Russian Federation, and on the other are five NATO nations, the United States, Canada, Denmark by virtue of Greenland, Norway. Those nations looking across an increasingly open seaway, that red line right across the middle is the sea lane of communication by the middle of this century, not so far away. Fortunately, we have organizations like the Arctic Council which seek to create a fora where nations can talk about these challenges. And the United States needs to up its game in the Arctic. I'm now showing you a picture of our one heavy icebreaker, Coast Guard vessel. Denmark, a nation of five million people, has five icebreakers. China, a nation, last time I checked, which has no Arctic footprint, China has 12 icebreakers. Russia has 26. We need to up our game. Well, let's wrap up this voyage by looking broadly at the oceans, because I've talked to you about individual seas. We should remember that the oceans are, in one sense, the largest crime scene in the world. Illegal fishing, underreported fishing. This is a multi-billion dollar business, and it is compounded by piracy in a wide variety of areas in the world. And also, because of the warming of the oceans, we are seeing more and more loss of that photosynthesis, and we are seeing massive amounts of plastics and pollution. In the center of the Pacific is a field of plastic the size of the state of Texas. So the oceans have challenges that are natural, man-made, and geopolitical. So right about now, you ought to be saying, <laughs> OK, Admiral, well, what do you think? What can we do about it? Are there opportunities? Do we have a 21st century strategy, the way we had a 19th century strategy from Alfred Thayer Mahan? Or for those of you who are fans of Game of Thrones, this is Euron Greyjoy. That's strategy. Build me a thousand ships and I will give you this world. Where's our strategy? Well, let me give you a couple ideas and then we'll bring Jane out and have a conversation. First of all, we need to listen better. Now, this is not Photoshop. This is this is an actual Belgian air defense system from about 80 years ago. And he's listening for incoming aircraft. I put it here as metaphor for the fact that we need to listen more to the oceans themselves, to our opponents, to ourselves, if we're going to craft a strategy. We also need education. This is the Naval War College, where we send young sailors, men and women, to build intellectual capital. That's part of creating a strategy. We also need to hold on to our values as we look at the oceans and as we look at our geopolitics. Our values come to us from the ancient Greeks, that's Socrates, from the East, that's the Buddha, through the Enlightenment, that's the young Voltaire. That's the best portrait ever of Voltaire. Normally you see him as a, uh, a very different figure through our founding fathers to really principled global leaders like Angela Merkel. We need to hold our values if we're going to craft a strategy for the oceans. 
We also need to operate in coalitions. The United States cannot be the world's policeman at sea any more than we can be the world's policeman ashore. This is a coalition operation against piracy off the coast of Africa. These are French special forces. They landed in an Italian helicopter. They refueled from a Dutch frigate. They had a Portuguese maritime patrol aircraft overhead, all operating from US intelligence from our overhead sensors. This kind of coalition activity has to be part of our maritime strategy. We need allies and partners to help us challenge China in the South China Sea, where Japan, South Korea, and Australia are participating in freedom of navigation operations. We need more of this, humanitarian operations from the sea. The voyages of these hospital ships, in my experience, are at least as important in creating security as the voyages of our aircraft carriers. We need creative new alliances. I would propose that the United States, Japan, and India are a powerful maritime alliance that we should think about in this 21st century. We need to be better at joint operations, Marines, Coast Guard, our Navy, as well as our Army, our Air Force, working together. We need international organizations. It's fashionable to kind of dismiss international organizations. This is the International Maritime Organization. It's headquartered in London. Highly effective in crafting the global response to piracy. We also need private-public cooperation. And I'll give you a practical example. This is a, a company, Blue Water Metrics, that uses merchant ships to implant sensors that can then provide real-time data on the health of the oceans used by governments in order to respond. That kind of private-public cooperation, like joint operations, like interagency operations, like international cooperation, has to be part of our maritime strategy. We need events like this, conversations with the public about the importance of the maritime world, and we need to read more. We need to read and understand the oceans. I was so happy to be in the library up on the 11th floor, which is an extraordinary repository here at the Marines Memorial of wonderful books about the oceans. All of that is part of the maritime strategy we need. So I'll wrap it up with uh, a couple of photos. The world and the oceans are gonna be choppy. This is the bow of an Arleigh Burke destroyer, similar to the McCain and the Fitzgerald, the two ships that have had terrible collisions. Things go wrong at sea. They can go terribly wrong, not just for merchants, but for US Navy vessels. Those are the two destroyers that had terrible collisions, 17 sailors dead. That's shocking to the US Navy. It's a combination of factors. We will find out what happened. We will relentlessly go to the bottom of it. We have fired the three-star, the two-star, the commodore, both ship captains, both ship executive officers, and both ship senior enlisted. Our accountability is ruthless, and it must be. We will fix this problem. But at the end of the day, the thought I want to leave you with about the oceans is that I spent 37 years, and I loved it. I loved having an office with a view every single day. So think about the oceans. We don't give them enough thought. They are a fundamental part of our nation's future, of our geography, of our history, of our strategy in this 21st century. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fabulous. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I told the Admiral that was fabulous, not only because he cited Voltaire, but that was pretty terrific. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Great. You know, a recurring theme in your remarks was this notion of both listening and seeing the point of view of, of an adversary yeah. or a competitor or even, even a friend. And we have several questions um, about North Korea. So sure. let's just start there. Sure. Um, as you think about, uh, you, you, what I think you said that Kim, Kim Jong-un was uh, unstable but not crazy. Correct. Or, and by that I 
take it to be mercurial, but, but exactly. rational. Exactly. Um, so what is his thinking? What mm. are his goals? And sure. what are his options? And as a response of sanctions, which mm. seems rational to me, mm. is it actually, is it relevant at mm -hmm. all? Um, his goals are, number one, to continue his life of power and prestige and to run his extraordinary dystopian world that has been created around him. He's a third generation dictator. We have not seen that in modern times before. And he was absolutely inculcated in that shark tank of a life. And so his number one goal is his self-preservation, that of his family and his cronies. Number two, his longer term goal is to dominate the Korean Peninsula. And he's been very clear about that. That's been the goal of North Korea for decades. And number three, he would like to gain respect on the stage of the world. So with those three goals in mind, I think your question, Jane, is exactly right. Can sanctions influence it? I think they can. The one red line he has, in my view, is, unfortunately, his nuclear weapons. He has watched what happened to Gaddafi when he gave up nuclear weapons, what happened to Saddam Hussein when he gave up nuclear weapons, what happened to the nation of Ukraine when they gave up nuclear weapons. They're now occupied by Russian forces. Um, he believes he has to hold on to those weapons because they fulfill all three of the objectives he has. Mm -hmm. So I think our best approach is going to be a combination of strong deterrence coupled with sanctions that eventually drag him to four-party or potentially six-party talks, four-party U.S., China, North Korea, South Korea, six party add Russia and Japan. Drag him to the table. I think the best we're gonna be able to do without going to a war in North Korea is to freeze his nuclear program and specifically to freeze his intercontinental ballistic program. I think it is unfortunately unrealistic to believe we're going to find a way for him to give up those weapons peacefully. And I'll close, if I may, by saying we ought to look speaking of the oceans, we had to look at a naval blockade. Mm. Again, I'm suspicious of historical analogy, but if you look back to the Cuban Missile Blockade, um, pretty effective, and it, it, it gave the initiative to the United States. It took it away from the Soviet Union. I think we need to gain the initiative here. That would be a way to couple with sanctions and drag him to the table and hopefully freeze the program at a place we can live with. So last thought, because people ask me, are we gonna go to war with North Korea? I'll give you the percentages. I think there's a 70% chance that we will muddle through this without exchanging ordinance. I think there's a 20% chance we will have an exchange of ordinance, but it will be limited in character. He will shoot a weapon at Guam, we will, take out a naval facility, he'll respond with uh, artillery barrage, but not at highly populated areas in Seoul, will start to escalate, but not go to an extreme. Jane, I think there's a 10% chance this goes sideways and we have a significant war on the Korean Peninsula. And that is, uh, I'd say, 500,000 to a million people minimum dead. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very deeply concerning scenario with a limited tool set and a limited uh, group of good options. The ones I mentioned, I think, are our best bet. Is being party to a nuclear arms control mm -hmm. agreement uh, something that would confer the kind of prestige he's looking for? Yes, and I think he wants, again, respect. He wants a small number of nuclear weapons. I think if we can accommodate that, we can best steer our way through this without really having a significant level of casualties. It's not an attractive set of outcomes, but I think it's the best one we could foresee realistically. So let me take you to Iran. Sure. Um, again, this is a region you know well, uh, part of the world you know well. Um, I guess just sort of starting with that, since we're talking about nuclear agreements, with that agreement, you know its merits and its mm -hmm. demerits. Um, 
what is your sense of, mm -hmm. of the importance of that agreement from a pure arms control perspective, mm -hmm. but also from a political perspective? Mm -hmm. What is the value in having forged an agreement with the moderate forces within mm -hmm. Iran? Yeah, I uh, opposed the agreement as it was being negotiated. Um, I felt in a tactical sense it, it did not bind Iran sufficiently, and of course, at the end of 10 years, 15 years, we could debate it. They're free to develop nuclear weapons. Um, however, I now believe it would be a mistake to try and unwind it. Um, you know, we've, we've had the debate, good deal, bad deal, it's a done deal. And so uh, the Europeans are now increasingly invested in business activity in Iran. Um, they're not going to come with us, especially with the Trump administration. And so uh, from where we sit today, you've got to play the ball from where it is on the field. Uh, from this point forward, I'd say we ought to keep it in place. We ought to confront Iran regionally in Yemen, in Damascus, in Iraq. Um, we ought to have the geopolitical competition that is unfolding. And we ought to play the long game, which is the forces of moderation in Iran. I think over the... 10 to 20 year future, the theocracy will die out. And I think that's our best bet in Iran. Um, we don't need another potential war in the Middle East. And cracking that agreement, I think, opens the door to that. Talk a little more about Yemen. Sure. I mean, we have a role there. Tell us what, sure. what is the long game? Yeah. How does it fit in, into in a long Yemen? game? In mm -hmm. Yemen? Um, so in Yemen, you see a, uh, a conflict between Sunni and Shia in the country and um, with uh, Iran supporting the uh, Shia forces and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states on the, for, on the side of the Sunni government. Um, it's turning into a, and most importantly, a horrific humanitarian disaster with an attendant famine. Uh, a cholera epidemic is breaking out. Um, the almost indiscriminate use of weapons by both sides are causing massive civilian casualties. And frankly, there's no end in sight. Um, I think that uh, the United States is, and I think this is appropriate, is working with the Saudi and the Gulf states, but trying to moderate the way in which they're conducting this campaign. But it is a good example of where we are going to have to confront Iran. Otherwise, they will sweep through Yemen, just as they are making significant gains in Damascus, in Lebanon, in Baghdad, and other places. So let me take you to another place. So sure. we've, we've got a question card on it, but also the president focused on Venezuela sure. in his remarks to the United Nations. Um, another part of the world you know well from Southern Indeed. Command. Yeah. Um, we see in Venezuela both the collapse of a political system and an, eco and an economy. Right. Uh, things are, are going truly south. Yeah. Um, what are our interests? Mm. And what is our potential positive influence? Sure. The, whenever you talk about the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean, and I'm, I'm from Miami, I speak Spanish, I have traveled extensively in that region, and I commanded all US forces south of the United States for three years. So I know it reasonably well. Everywhere you go, Latin Americans, individuals in the Caribbean, that world, they remember the US military as an instrument of intervention. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we don't really think of ourselves that way. You know, we, we kind of say, oh yeah, it's an important part of the world. You know, that's America's backyard. Well, first of all, think about that expression and how that sounds, America's backyard. I mean, we're not Canada's backyard. Um, and secondly, you need to know the history here. Sometimes I'll ask an audience, how many times do you think the United States has invaded a country in Latin America or the Caribbean in the last 150 years? And most audiences will say, well, you know, not that many, you know, Grenada, Mexican-American War, uh, Spanish-American War, Cuba, you know, and they start <laughs> adding it up and they'll say, you know, I don't know, maybe 15 times, maybe 20 times. The correct answer, folks, is 77 times. We've invaded Mexico 11 times. Um, we've invaded the Dominican Republic six times. Some of these are small. You know, we're in the Marines Memorial here. The Marines have a, a, a robust history in this part of the world. Um, often a company of Marines would take over the banking system in Nicaragua for a while. 
But an invasion is an invasion. It's the imposition of armed troops for political purpose in a sovereign state without the consent of that state. That's an invasion. We've done it 77 times. We don't remember that. You know, if the United States were a dog, which we're not, but if we were, we'd be a golden <laughs> retriever. We'd be kind of bounding through the world, and our tail would knock things over, and we'd be a good-natured dog. <laughs> but would be an annoying dog. And, and, and in Latin America and the Caribbean, they remember it. And this is a long way of saying how counterproductive it is for, for example, President Trump to muse about, well, we might have to intervene militarily in Venezuela. You know, for the Latin Americans, this is, oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we should be doing, Jane, is working with the Organization of American States, pushing Colombia and Brazil and Mexico to the front of this conversation. If we're going to put sanctions on, they ought to be highly targeted against the Maduro clack that are running the government. Um, we need to be in the background and have our Latin American partners in the front. And the good news is they're ready to step up and do that, particularly President Juan Manuel Santos in Colombia, who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, by the way, uh, Fletcher graduate, for, <laughs> for negotiating the end of the 60-year insurgency. So there are very capable diplomats who can work this. Um, we need to be supportive. We need perhaps targeted sanctions. We don't need to be talking about invasions. There is no US military role in Venezuela, uh, but it is the crisis flying under the radar. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the chances of a violent ending there are higher than they are in Korea, and that is very worrisome. I'm going to take you back to Asia then, mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to your theme of seeing the world through their eyes. Um, and that's China's view of its role sure. in the world. We've yeah. thought of it for a long time as not seeking to project power. Mm -hmm. In fact, to tend to business at home. Yeah. Now it's, you know, it, it, it offers economic competition, yeah. uh, political competition, mm -hmm. military. and military mm -hmm. competition. How does it see its mm -hmm. own role? Mm -hmm. um, Deng Xiaoping, and you'll know the story, but um, was asked um, how he felt about China's role. China sees itself not as a nation. Uh, they see themselves as a civilization. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deng said to Kissinger, um, well, we've had a couple bad centuries, but we're coming back. <laughs> China plays the long game in a way that we can't begin to comprehend. Mm -hmm. So China has spent the last 50 years starting and stopping, but essentially lifting people out of poverty. Um, they've done a very credible job. They've probably lifted close to a billion people out of poverty and extreme poverty under UN definitions. They are now ready to begin a, a more expansive role in the world. President Xi went to Davos and gave the most globalized speech about the yeah. Silk Road, the Belt and Suspenders, uh, all of China's economic movement. On the military front, China claims the South China Sea. And that is a preposterous claim under international law. But they believe they own it. Why? Because of Admiral Zheng He, because they have been there forever. They say it's a historical claim. What they really want, Jane, are the hydrocarbons. That is the one missing piece of China's strategic suite in the 21st century is a lack of hydrocarbons. They exist under the South China Sea. Yeah. Yeah. So China will push into that zone. And as I pointed out, China's Navy is now operating globally. They work more and more with the Russian Navy, and together that's a pretty formidable force. And they, are, uh, they have just built their first uh, overseas military base in the Horn of Africa. Now, you know, the United States has 100 overseas bases. We're a global power, but we need to recognize the fact that China is rising. Has it moved, is it moving away from a minimum deterrent in its, in its nuclear program? I, I think the nuclear strategic deterrent with China is sufficient and in an appropriate place. Where I think we are in a wild west with China is in cyber. Mm -hmm. And here we see Chinese activity both in terms of theft of intellectual property, of traditional espionage, 
but increasingly finding and probing into our infrastructure. That, I think, is the most worrisome trade space we have with China, along with the disagreement about the South China Sea. Let me tell you what I think we should do about it geopolitically. We should get closer to India. India. In 200 years, a historian's going to write a history of the 21st century. It's not going to be about the rise of China. It'll be about the rise of India because of demographics, yeah. because it's a democracy, because it has English as an elite language that connects it to the world. Um, India, for all of its challenges with corruption and infrastructure and, and a thousand other things, I'd bet on this century on India. So a way to think of this is US, European Union, our value set, our democracy, China rising. 21st century is about India. Where does India end up aligned? We would be very smart to be working to move India here. That's how we can balance geopolitically. That's how we balance China. It doesn't mean we're going to war, but it means we're creating a network of alliances. Yeah. In the last 20 years, we have been moving in we that direction. We have indeed, and much. I applaud that so. by the Bush administration, by the Clinton administration, and I hope we'll see that continue. Yep. By yep. the way, with Ambassador Nikki Haley, who is Indian American. Mm -hmm. And doing a fabulous job. Fabulous job. Yep. My pick for the top official in the Trump administration, full stop, and I love Jim Mattis. Yep. I think Nikki Haley, with a really lousy hand of cards, yep in the United Nations is punching way above her weight. In your book, Destroy Our Captain. Oh, that's going back a ways. You talk about, well, if, you, if you write <laughs> yeah. 11 books, you know. Um, but it's, it's um, you describe your, your paternal grandfather as having come over from Turkey as a result of the ethnic cleansing there. Refugee. Come over as a refugee to this country. Um, ended up having a grandson in this, in this extraordinary role. I, I wonder, as you think about that and you think about his contribution sure. to this country, um, and you look at this horrible, you know, disastrous uh, situation with you know, over 60 million refugees around the world or, or migrants around the world, but particularly you know, right now, spilling out of, yeah. out of Syria, a lot of them, mm -hmm. uh, women and children. Mm -hmm. We're saying we don't want to take them. And we are what, failing. What should we be doing? We should hold our values. And that is both morally correct and it's pragmatically correct. When I talk to my German friends who took in one million refugees from Syria on a population of 80 million, population adjusted, that would be like the United States taking three and a half million refugees. That's what the Germans did. We would be taking three and a half million to meet their commitment. We've taken 6,000. Mm -hmm. We're failing, and there's a pragmatic component. In Germany, these refugees will come, and the first generation will open shawarma shops and small businesses. The second generation will go to university. The third generation will be CEOs yeah. of big companies. And we know that because we've watched that yeah. generation after generation in the United States of America. There's a pragmatic component here, and there's a moral component, and we are missing the boat. And I'll, I'll give you the pragmatic component one more round, which is to say, think about a young father in Syria who takes the hand of his three-year-old son, puts his one-year-old in a backpack, and he and his wife walk across Turkey. They get in a boat. They make it to Germany. I want that person on my team. Yeah. Yeah. How much courage does that take? How much determination? How much endurance? Germany will trade up with the vast majority. Will there be a few terrorists? Will there be a few bad people? You bet. But at the end of the day, there'll be a pragmatic upside and there'll be a moral upside to doing this. And if I could, I'll, I'll close, because I know we're almost out of time with the last sea story about my grandfather. Um, and it's this. In 1922, the city of Smyrna, it's called Izmir today, in western Turkey, was burned uh, as part of a, a war between Greece and Turkey. 
but it was burned by the Turkish army and the Armenian and Greek communities, many of them were massacred. My grandparents were very lucky. They stood on a quay wall and watched the city burn behind them in 1922. They were rescued by Greek fishermen, brought to Athens, and then took ship to the United States of America, 1922. 1992, their grandson, me, I went back to that quay wall and I pulled up in my billion dollar US warship of which I was the captain. And the Turkish liaison officer came aboard and he said, Captain Stavridis, Stavridis, is that a Greek name? <laughs> I, said, I said, actually my grandparents were citizens of the Ottoman Empire until they were invited to leave. And I think we need to remember both the compassionate and the pragmatic reasons in so many cases for these refugees. We don't hear that side of the conversation often enough, Jane. So one, one last question, and sure. that is that you, you were rumored to be uh, considered to be the running mate of Hillary Clinton yeah. in her presidential campaign, and then rumored to be uh, Donald Trump's uh, choice or, uh, for, for Secretary of State. If you had taken one of those jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you still had in mind your desire to have all your Fletcher graduates yeah. go into government service. What kind of model would you want to put forth mm -hmm. and how would you do it? What, how would you signal that this is an honorable thing to do? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, those aren't rumors. Those are both true statements. Um, I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton. She ultimately selected Tim Kaine. Uh, good choice, good man, I know him well. Um, if Secretary Clinton had asked me to go into government to serve as national security op advisor, I would have done so. Um, President-elect at the time, Trump, asked me to Trump Tower. I rode the golden elevator. I spent an hour <laughs> and a half with him. Um, and at the end of that, he offered me a cabinet position as director of national intelligence. He did not, mm. his chief of staff did. I declined it because I had significant policy disagreement with the Trump administration. But to answer your question, I would hope that those who want to serve are centrists, are balanced, are respectful of others, listen more than they speak, have real intellectual capital, own our values, have a sense of humor, and a sense of humility. And that's what we try and convey to our Fletcher students as we encourage them to serve their country in some capacity. You make us all want to go back to school. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, this Jane. Was wonderful. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.